With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, Heard Tell, welcome back. I'm Andrew Donaldson. So thrilled you're joining us on this Monday, last day of January, the 31st year of our Lord. 2022 one month down 11 to go goes fast don't it folks so much to cover today uh we're going to get into the kerfluffle online a lot of caterwauling over the fact that president biden has promised to pick a black woman for the supreme court we'll get into that uh we're also going to talk about the chinese olympics we're going to review some things we've already been covering a new update to that evolving story that we're going to be talking a lot about in the coming weeks also on the show today our friend brooke medina she has a piece out uh, writing in World News about uh, a bill that would drastically change how you buy products, how they're presented on shelves. It's aimed at big tech, but it would affect a lot more things like apps, like online shopping, like what you see on the stores in your grocery aisle. Also, a viral video that's actually viral for good reasons to close out the program. You know, we always want to end on a good note, and this is a very good note of some young people going old school and helping an elderly person across the street. Basic as it sounds, it makes for good humanity. But first, uh, let's talk about this bridge in Pennsylvania. You may have saw in the last week this bridge collapsed. Um, the Forbes Avenue Bridge over Frick Park collapsed. This is a park and a bridge. It was very dramatic uh, images. Uh, nobody got seriously hurt by some miracle, thankfully. This also coincided, believe it or not, with President Biden coming to Pittsburgh to tout his infrastructure program. Call that interesting timing. Uh, while the conspiracy theorists are having some fun with that, the truth is this bridge was known to have problems, had been marked as a structure that was in trouble uh, for quite some time, and it collapsed. Now, bridge collapses are not that common in America. They're more common overseas for good reason. We try to have better infrastructure and better oversight here. But it happened. This bridge came down. But let's turn down the noise on this for just a second because everybody's taking this. And because President Biden was there and because we just passed a massive infrastructure program, are slamming this round peg into the nice square hole of whatever their priors were. Uh, one of them was Governor Tom Wolf. Governor Tom Wolf of Pennsylvania took to the Twitter and said this, quoting Governor Tom Wolf uh, from January 28th, this morning a bridge collapsed in Pittsburgh. Multiple cars and a bus fell about 100 feet down a hillside. There was also a large gas leak. This bridge had gas lines attached to it like uh, is not uncommon with bridges that have utility lines as part of their infrastructure, especially older bridges. First responders arrived quickly. Luckily, there were no fatalities so far. They are still searching for possible victims under the collapse. There were none under the collapse, by the way. Uh, we shouldn't have to rely on luck to keep people safe. I'm thankful to POTUS, uh, Senator Bob Casey, and Democrats in the congressional delegation who fought for the bipartisan infrastructure law. These are life-changing investments in building and repairing our nation's infrastructure. Shame on the Republican lawmakers who didn't support the bipartisan infrastructure law. Pennsylvania lives are on the line. It is long past time for the political games to come to an end. That's what Governor Tom Wolf, I'll let you guess which party he is after those statements. You won't have to need a second guess. Folks, that's all well and good except for a couple of problems here. Uh, what do we talk about on this program? I don't care what your political party is. I don't care what your ideology is. If you're sitting in the chair and you got a title, you should be accountable. Tom Wolf's been governor of Pennsylvania since 2015. He's had more than enough time to work on this state's infrastructure. Yes, I realize the legislative situation in Pennsylvania. Republicans have plenty of power to thwart him from doing whatever he wanted. But we looked. I haven't seen a lot of evidence where he actually put rhetoric about all the bridges and pittsburgh has a ton of bridges by the way it's one of the most bridge cities in america very mountainous if you've never been there he hasn't done a lot about this since 2015 but he wants to tout the infrastructure bill well about that if we go to nbcwashington.com a uh, piece came out same day the bridge collapse happened the bridge collapse i'm quoting from uh, nbc here the bridge the pittsburgh bridge collapsed early friday morning injuring 10 people was in poor condition but was not targeted for improvement under the federal infrastructure bill state records show. Huh. 
the Ford Avenue Bridge over Frick Park, a major artery for morning commuters heading downtown. Uh, they estimate about 14,000 people cross this bridge a day. That's a pretty busy bridge. Fell hours before Joe Biden was scheduled to speak in town to promote his administrative's administration's $500 billion infrastructure package. Pennsylvania is set to receive more than $327 million in federal funding for bridge repair and replacement under the infrastructure plan, with about $49 million going to off-system or local bridges like the Forbes Avenue Bridge. But the bridge is not among the highway and bridge projects targeted for federal funding in the state's 2021 Transportation Improvement Program. City officials haven't said why the bridge, built in 1970, wasn't placed on the list. In other words, this was a local problem and a state problem, and they didn't do anything about it for years and years and years. In fact, there's other reporting where some funding that was tagged for this specific bridge may have gone somewhere else. We couldn't validate that to our standards, so we'll leave that for you to go look on your own. Also, Washington Post, writing about this same subject, is bylined by Timothy Bielas, Sean Sullivan, Ian Duncan, and Merrill Kornfeld. But down at the bottom of it, it's also a news piece about the collapse. Um, an interesting little tidbit. Um, Kevin Heaslett, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Washington Post, I'm reading from here, a civil and environmental engineer professor at Virginia Tech. By the way, I just did a piece on transportation, uh, Virginia Tech's highway safety uh, arm. It, of course, it's an engineering school. They are excellent. They are the standard for research on things involving transportation. I just use them in the piece. So anytime you need something uh, infrastructure related, transportation structure related, go to Virginia Tech, look up their data. Almost all of it's public. Excellent resource to get your own information on these items. By the way, I'm a West Virginia Mountaineer. So if I'm complimenting Virginia Tech, you know, um, it's the truth because otherwise we can't stand those Hokies. Back to the piece. Said a bridge rated in poor condition normally is not an immediate danger, but is showing signs of wear. Had inspectors found any cause for concern in September, they would have taken action then, he said, suggesting that whatever caused the collapse had developed recently. DOTs are very conservative when it comes to these inspections, Haslip said. If they think there's any chance of failure, there's going to, they're going to close the bridge. About 45,000 of the nation's bridges are rated in poor condition, and Friday's stark scene allowed Biden to make his frequent point about the country's repair needs with unusual immediacy. Convenient. He often frames the need to restore the country's infrastructure as a critical part of U.S. efforts to complete globally with other economic powers. The collapse underscores the country's challenge in dealing with a backlog of projects aimed at repairing, rehabilitating, or replacing aging bridges. In an analysis due to be released next week, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association has concluded that at the current rate of repair, it would take 30 years to fix every bridge in the U.S. that is in poor condition. In all, the group found that 224,000 bridges needed some kind of repair for a total cost of $260 billion. Pennsylvania is among the hardest hit states with 3,200 bridges in poor condition, second only to Iowa, according to the analysis. Given those needs, Pennsylvania is in line to receive $1.6 billion in bridge repair funds, for the infrastructure law in the coming five years, a substantial amount, but far less than experts estimate is needed. Let's just pause here for a second. What do we start with? Uh, the governor has been governor for a long time. This bridge has known to be a problem for a long time. And we just passed a huge infrastructure bill with a ton of money in it. If all these bridges is estimated to cost $260 billion to fix, why didn't Congress just make a bill for $260 million and fix them? Now, the answer to that is obvious. The 260 figure is just from a study, not from the government. And there's other machinations. But a large part of this is when we have a big infrastructure bill, they put things like fixing bridges up front to get it passed. But in the actual text and then the actual spending of money, a lot of that money goes other places. They slide in things that are not infrastructure related. They slide in things that are not as immediately pressing. But fixing the bridges gets it done. But the actual fixing of bridges doesn't get done. The beginning, middle, and end of the infrastructure bridge collapse in Pennsylvania doesn't have anything to do with the infrastructure bill that is only a few months old from dating from last year, when this bridge has been a known problem for years. It's not just a political issue. It's a government accountability issue. Government is supposed to take care of things like roads. Politician runs on roads, especially local ones. We're going to fix them roads. We're going to fix them bridges. Then when they get into office, they spend a lot of money on everything else and they don't actually get it done. 
You can talk about whatever else you want here, but the powers that be in Pennsylvania are responsible for this bridge collapsing, and there's no way around that. You can That's Republicans. That's Democrats. That's the Democratic governor. That's the Republicans in the legislature. That's local people who may or may not have raised enough noise to get this fixed. This is a government accountability issue. When a bridge collapses, it doesn't do it overnight unless it's hit by something or something catastrophic happens. And we know in this case, this bridge was known to be a problem for a long time. And every elected leader in the chain of political command in Pennsylvania should have to answer for it, regardless of their party, regardless of what they say they did. The evidence is laying at the bottom of Fern Hollow Bridge in a pile that they were not accountable. And now we got a fallen bridge to prove it. More hotel right after this. Welcome back to Hertel. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us. However, you're listening, whether you're doing day of or if you're listening to a past episode, thrilled to have you. Uh, make sure you reach out and let us know you're out there. You got questions, comments, epistles, whatever you got, send them to us at Show at gmail.com at Hertel Show on the Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Also, both me and our guests, our Twitter handles show up on those bottom third graphics. Make sure you reach out and support them, follow them, uh, stay part of the discussion. That's what we want to do here on Herd Tell. Uh, let's turn down the noise on the Supreme Court stuff right now. A lot of talk over the fact that President Biden has promised to nominate a black woman for the Supreme Court. Folks, there's a trap here, and I, I want all of us to avoid it because it does nothing about what's going to happen. Uh, the Supreme Court nominee is going to be a black woman unless President Biden reverses himself, which I doubt because it would end his political uh, power whatsoever. The base would revolt. Um, this is going to happen. This is not going to change the makeup of the court. This is going to be a liberal justice replaced by another liberal or progressive justice. Uh, this is all baked into the cake. This is going to happen. It's not going to be stopped, but we're going to talk about it for months on end. So keep your bearing on this because it's inevitable. It's going to happen. So be careful how much emotional capital you invest or how much bandwidth you burn on something that's just going to happen. I'm noticing a lot of folks in media are getting very upset over the fact that this was promised to be a black woman on the Supreme Court. Folks, you're going to wind up discussing this in a way that's going to reveal a whole lot more about you than you might want to reveal if you're not very careful and you don't keep your bearing. And then you're going to actually affect the outcome, which is already set in stone and is going to happen. Let me just put it to you this way. If you're upset about the fact that he said it's going to be a black woman, okay, but just remember, President Trump promised to nominate a woman. President Reagan promised to nominate a woman. By the way, if you're very online, he did it wearing a tan suit, for what it's worth. Rattle that one around in your head. Um, there's nothing wrong with these presidents making promises to diversify the court. I understand you want to talk about hypocrisy. I understand you might want to apply it to other issues. But you're just going to wind up down a rabbit hole you don't want to get into. We've had 115 Supreme Court justices. 110 of them were white men. Now, you might have an argument about him promising for a black woman if there was none that were qualified, but there are. Even both sides, the list that he's probably going to be picking from, there's multiple candidates that are more than qualified for the Supreme Court. And I know you can point in the past to the Democratic Party blocking people like Judge Brown, who could have been the first one. You can talk about that all you want to, but the fact at hand is he's going to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court. It's probably overdue that we have a woman of color on the Supreme Court, and the people he nominates are probably going to be qualified. We'll see who it is. There are some that are more qualified than others. By the way, just because the Supreme Court justice doesn't believe exactly how you are, do doesn't make them not qualified for the Supreme Court. That's not what they're there for. In my opinion, my humble but accurate opinion, you need to have the best liberal minds, judicial-wise, on the court. You need to have the best conservative minds on the court. I'd like to have a great libertarian judicial mind on the court because the court is there to hash these items out especially right now where our system of government is broken and the legislation, legislative branch are not doing their job and the executive branch is overreaching and not doing their job. We need great minds on the court and we need opposing minds 
who see these issues differently and hash them out for the betterment of the entire country because the country is big, it's pluralistic, and it's diverse. We need a Supreme Court that is the same way. Oh, I know that means you may not get what you want on every single issue, but you getting what you want on every single issue may not be the best thing for the country, even though you think so. The Supreme Court is not supposed to be legislating. It's not supposed to be making law. I know that's how it happens in practicality because of the way the system works right now, but that's not their role. They're to oversee. They're to make judgments. They're to apply the Constitution. And I want the best legal minds possible on the court that can do that. So don't go chasing the phantoms online about why President Biden is going to pick a black woman for the Supreme Court. I understand there's political implications there. But you've got a long, long list of just white men on the court that's going to counterbalance any argument that you make. It's overdue. He's going to do it, accept it, learn to live with it, and let's discuss the actual nominee based on its merits once it's announced. That's what we're going to do here. We'll have on our friends like M. Carpenter, who I've already spoken to, and is going to be doing up a profile like she did with Amy Comey Barron and others. We'll talk about all those things going forward. Remember, too, those of you that really want to bash President Biden for this, and there may be cause for some debate depending on who he nominates. Remember, Justice Kavanaugh was only on the court because Justice Kennedy negotiated that. That wasn't a decision. And presidents, let's be real and have some grown folk talk here, don't really pick the Supreme Court nominees. They're given a list at best or a name at worst and told to go with it with the powers that be that even presidents answer to. So keep your bearing. Let's dig into the facts of the case and the record of the actual nominee and not get all out of hand with all this other stuff before it's even happened. More Heard Tell right after this. Ah, Welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm thrilled about this one because it's been a minute since I've gotten to talk to her, although she's been a friend for a long time. Uh, She's the vice president of communications for the John Locke Foundation, but she's also a writer in her own right, published all over the place. Brooke Medina, how are you, my friend? Hey, I am so glad to be on here, and thank you for having me. Yeah, we haven't got to actually do a podcast, and I went and looked. I was curious. It's been almost a year and a half since we did a podcast together. Wow, far uh, too long. Far, far too long. Which Uh, is why this one's going to be five hours. Did you tell your listeners (laughs) that yet? We're making up for lost time. Poor TK, our radio producer, just fainted because he's going (laughs) to think I'm going to blow my total runtime. All right. Uh, You were writing over at World. That's uh, WNG.org.com, World News. Uh, There's Stop me if you heard this one before. There's a bad bill floating around out there. Uh, This particular one is called the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Well, that sounds good. How can anybody be against innovation and choice online. But as we have learned with these kind of machinations, the title uh, does not fully give you the sense of what's actually going on here, does it? Not at all. It's such a misnomer. And I mean, I've got to give it to Congress and the, these senators, they're marketing people or something. They're, they're good at what they do, right? They can, they can uh, cloak these bills that are really pretty darn nefarious in some fanciful language and hope the American people can stomach it. But this particular bill is anything other than innovative or choice centric. Actually, it does the exact opposite, which I just, it boggles my mind that, um, that they could actually advocate for this bill with a straight face because it limits consumer choices. And I know we'll get into some of the mechanics of how it does that, um, but it also stifles innovation. Now, I'm one of those gluttons for punishment that you did the one thing I always want writers to do. You actually linked to the text of the bill itself, which not enough people do. So thank you for that. So I went and read this thing. And the first thing that jumped out at me was the masthead on this because all bills at the top, they say in the Senate or in the House, if they come out of the House. And they have the sponsors. And I was looking at the sponsor list on this bill, and it really jumped out at me because the head, the big ticket items on there was uh, Amy Klobuchar and uh, Chuck Grassley, senators, respectively. But look at the other names on here. It's Dick Durbin, Lindsey Graham, Blumenthal, uh, Kennedy from Louisiana, Cory Booker, Loomis, Hirano, Warner, Hawley, Dane. These are people that would not go in a room together, but somehow they wound up on this bill together. Did that not strike you right off the top that this seems like an odd mix of people sponsoring this bill? On its face, it looks like that. If you were thinking in terms of, I would say the typical 
political paradigm of D's and R's. Um, this though, if you look at it through more of an ideological paradigm between limited government folks and populists, you can see that this makes a lot more sense when you are looking at it through a lens of, okay, well, which members of Congress in the Senate in particular, irrespective of their uh, political affiliation, appeal to that more populist sentiment in the United States that we, we've uh, been grappling with for several years now. And in that case, of course, it's no surprise then to see a Warren and a Hawley on this list of senators that have endorsed it. Yeah, because Holly and, the, you know, he's kind of been Mr. Populous uh, among mm -hmm. other issues that he's had lately. But then you have some kind of traditional center left kind of liberal senators on there with him. This may be part of a bigger conversation for for later. But what is it about the populist right where they're finding some common cause with big government in things like regulating the Internet, regulating commerce? And frankly, let's just call it what it is, regulating things they don't like. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And it's certainly dangerous because it stands to really impede innovation. Uh, but beyond that, the policy is about people. And the fact that Congress is playing so fast and loose with private property rights and people's ability to engage in just daily commercial activities uh, is problematic. But um, I think undergirding this is, uh, like I mentioned, this populist sentiment, but behind that populist sentiment is, I would say, a, a belief that technocrats and central um, centralized authorities can make decisions on behalf of a large group of people. Um, so really what it is at its root, I would say, is in overconfidence and the ability of legislation to handle a market economy. Um, it's kind of like Keynesian, Keynesianism 2.0. Yeah. And you talked about when you wrote about this at world, uh, WNG.org is where this piece can be found. We're talking to Brooke Medina. Um, right off the bat, you jumped on this with a quote from uh, Senator Grassley's own press people uh, saying, quote, if we make carve outs for all the pro consumer features, then the bill will be useless. Uh why did that get out of his mouth? Because that sure seems like it gave the game away here, didn't it? I wonder what sort of like conversation happened in Senator Grassley's office after that story broke. That was uh, through Washington Examiner reporting that I found that. Um, and A, I mean, the fact that they actually said that quiet part out loud is uh, abhorrent if you are a communications person in their office and good luck at doing crisis comms on something like that. But secondly, um, what this reveals is, I would say, a fundamental mis misuse of antitrust law. And so what they're saying right there is because this bill has many features that will actually attack consumers or harm consumers, let's not actually, you know, focus on that element of the bill. But really, when you're thinking about antitrust law in general here in the United States, ever since uh, Judge Bork kind of defined it for us in the late 20th century. Um, antitrust law is only to be utilized if it protects or in, if it hurts consumers. So this particular bill, I mean, they're talking about it being pro or that if we were to remove the pro-consumer elements of it, that it would, uh, there would be really nothing to the bill. And I think that really reveals the heart behind this bill. It's not a consumer centric piece of legislation that was enacted to protect the American people whose paychecks, for example, are being ravaged by inflation at the moment. The central point of this bill is to basically stick it to companies that Senator Klobuchar and Grassley and those who have sponsored it don't like. It's also to look as if they are doing something about big tech, which is funny because this has nothing to do with censorship. So they know, though, that when voters hear about this bill and they, you know, they, they use these magic words of, you know, punishing big tech, like Senator Hawley loves to rail on, that it will just get people to endorse it without actually understanding what's in it. But it does nothing to address the censorship concerns on the right um, or the, the sort of platforming issues that many on the left have claimed. Um, and so it's just the whole bill is is a charade of um, and, it, and it's misleading to the voters. Now, you're a comms expert, so I'm going to I'm going to take it to you this way. You know, as a comms person, if you're pitching a story, 
you want to have a good guy and a bad guy. And then therefore, whatever the good guy is going is justified because those are bad people over there and we're the good guys. Well, there seems to be an element to this particular bill, the way it's written, and you touch on it in your piece because, and I'll just quote it to you here. It says in this current form, the legislation narrowly targets Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Meta, that's Facebook's new itineration, due to their market share. But the principle behind the proposal is akin to federal regulation regulators walking the aisle of Costco, your favorite place on God's earth, and pulling each Kirkland brand product from the shelves and placing it further back so that consumers would see the price of your name brand products first. They're throwing big names out here, but what they're really talking about that's not real. There's some sleigh of hand going on here, isn't it? And they're just kind of putting those big names up front. Yeah, it's it's smoke and mirrors to be sure. And so what this does is it looks as if they are trying to punish big tech for allegedly misbehaving what in whatever form like that particular party is aggrieved about. Um, but really what it does is it's going to hurt small businesses and small nonprofits, such as my organization that I work at, who utilize the digital infrastructure from Google and Meta to be able to reach large audiences. And, um, and it's also going to hurt everyday American consumers because this would essentially mean that Amazon Prime, Amazon Basics, like these sorts of things cannot be put forth before the consumer um, as, a, as a good alternative to that price, your product they were about to add to their cart. And so um, this is the, the central grievance that Cong these uh, senators are alleging um, they are trying to rectify. But A, why is it any of their business that, that companies you know, decide to prioritize their generic products? And B, how is that defensible? I mean, are they going to go into CVS Pharmacy next and demand that the, the off-brand CVS brand ibuprofen be moved to the back so that the more expensive Motrin can be purchased first? Yeah, we're talking to Brooke Medina. Uh, we're going to continue to break down the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Specifically, she writes about even though this is a piece of legislation, the result, if it stood as it is, is going to recreate a mess in the court system. We'll get into that. Also talk a little bit about the rest of the things she has going on. Uh, Brooke Medina, more with her on her tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Her Tell. We're continuing to talk to Brooke Medina. She's got a piece out at World News, uh, WNG.org, about this new American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Okay, so normally with this legislation, we talk about the devil being in the details. Uh, one of the reasons at Ordinary Times and other places, we always post the source documents. I already told you I appreciate you linking to the actual legislation. I wish all news items and opinion pieces did that. You should, looking at y'all that don't do that. But this kind of legislation actually has the opposite problem because it has a lot of buzzwords. It has a lot of Google, Microsoft bad. There's a lot of vague language when you actually get into the legalities of this. And that has real world consequences if you pass vague language legislation, don't you? Indeed, that's the case. And so it would essentially create a, the conditions wherein the courts have to adjudicate and decide what this language is supposed to mean. So um, I encourage listeners to go ahead and take a look at the bill online. Um, you can find it where Andrew mentioned at WNG.org, where, um, where, I, where I link to it, but also just going to the, the, the Senate's website. But yeah, really at the end of the day, what this bill would ultimately do is just um, because of the vagueness of the language, there will be inevitable lawsuits. And then the judiciary is going to be responsible for figuring out, okay, well, what are the web metrics on this particular product that Amazon Basics, maybe it's a three-pack men's white t-shirt, for example, and Fruit of the Loom is going to sue now because it was, uh, it was prioritized in Amazon's algorithm so as to be presented before the Fruit of the Loom or Hanes brand. And so now the courts are going to decide that. Do we really think that they are competent or equipped or called to make such adjudications related to digital infrastructure? I don't think so. Yeah. And if you've been following the Roberts Court the last few years, a lot of the big ticket, big name, high pushed uh, decisions they've made, 
they've had to write in there over and over again, this is the purview of the legislative branch. The legislative branch needs to fix this issue after issue. They keep saying that. But when you write, uh, you call this reactionary uh, legislation, short-sighted mm-hmm. legislation. I think you're correct on both points. When you write bad legislation, it is inevitable that it's going to wind up in the court system, and then it's out of the hands of the elected representatives of the people, and it's in the hands of the judges, who I understand they go through confirmation processes, but there's no direct electoral result to what they do. It's not too much of an exaggeration to say this is a good example of how our system is so out of balance right now with the judiciary having, we're getting ready to do another Supreme Court nomination. This stuff's gotten life and death because we're dumping so much on the court because Congress just ain't handling their business by writing nice, focused, makes sense legislation that has the legal terminology clearly defined. Yeah, and that is within their actual purview. And I would argue that this is not even the business of Congress. And so it's funny when senators like Senator Elizabeth Warren rail against Kroger, for example, and grocery store monopolies, when it's just clear they don't they don't either understand or they're choosing to, you know, to veil um, their true intentions about how the market works and how consumer preferences will naturally create really big businesses on some fronts until a consumer preference tidal wave changes that sentiment. Um, I know people have heard this example many times, but when we think about the digital landscape in the Yahoo and AOL and Juno and MySpace that were of times past versus where we're at now, and even the competitors that are starting to come to the stage, such as Shopify, which is now Amazon's chief chief competitor, um, nothing stays the same for very long. And we know how slow the courts are. And it just doesn't make sense for Congress to try to create these technicalities um, that target just a narrowly defined group of businesses um, just because they're trying to basically wreak some punishment on them. It's very short-sighted, very reactionary. It's just to make them look like they're doing something. And it's actually going to hurt American consumers. And let's talk about those consumers for a minute because you work for an advocacy org, a nonprofit org. Um, There's a huge disconnect, and you know this because this is your job. You do comms for them, trying to get people to care about policy, trying to get people to care about the nuts and bolts of legislation because people just don't. They're busy. It's a lot of nomenclature. It's a lot of big words. Um, They don't have time for it. But I've found in, in what I've done and a lot of other people have When it gets to consumer choice, this is actually a really good way to get normal people who aren't obsessed over the news cycle understanding, hey, this legislative process matters, politics matters, elections have consequences. It seems to me like these kind of consumer issues are a good way to engage those people who might be turned off by like the culture wars or the back and forth of the bipartisan divide and those sorts of things. This affects everybody, and it's a good way to get people that are disengaged in the government process reengaged again. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, people, when when you mess with people's kids and you mess with their finances, they're going to have something to say about, about it. And I think that that's the most direct way is for them to feel these sorts of pains um, at the pump uh, in their kids' homework when they're looking at some of this, uh, the, the, the things that their kids are learning at school, um, but also in what they're paying for in everyday purchases, whether it's something from Amazon basics, medication, like these are the things that our polling has consistently revealed that consumers and voters care about. It's stuff that is affecting their families. It's nice to talk about, and it's important to talk about some of the more nebulous items that are, um, that are going to kind of like in second and third order of effects, um, impact voters. But honestly, I think the best way to reach maybe a lot of the disaffected voters is through uh, direct uh, impact legislation such as this. And this would really, really hit home very soon for most people. And you think about it. I mean, Amazon was a godsend over the pandemic when people were just not sure where they where they could go, if they could go anywhere, if they were under lockdowns, if it was safe to go places. And it's just silly and absurd to think about uh, Congress trying to punish businesses solely because they are big or because they can develop some political clout for it. Yeah. And you guys do polling. I know you you can keep a watch on these types of issues. Um, this is one of those things where tw- Twitter ain't real life because things on like Twitter and Facebook, they get really loud about how evil Amazon is. Some of this policy stuff just comes down to the fact that Amazon's way more popular than Congress is. 
And yes. is it is it sometimes we just lose in our politics? We get so wrapped up in kind of the horse race and that part of the politics, we forget things like, hey, there, <laughs> there's a third of the country that doesn't even vote most elections, and they love Amazon way more than they like politics. And then it just doesn't show up until we start addressing issues like this. Yeah, well, it's funny because there is a temptation for people that are in my world, and I, I, I sure know it's a temptation for myself, where if I look at what's happening and being said on Twitter, I think that that's somehow an accurate reflection of uh, the American people at large, and it simply is not. Uh, people care about what is actually happening in their communities, not what some wonky person said you know, in some far off place in a very, very long white paper. And so what we what we need to remember is, yeah, to keep our fingers on the pulse of what everyday Americans and voters are thinking about these issues. And like I said repeatedly, the polling indicates they care about what's happening in their at their kitchen tables, in their children's classrooms, at the pump, at the grocery store and in their communities. And so I don't know. I mean, these senators, they're they're promising a lot with this sort of legislation. And I think they're they're going to dig their own graves politically on this front if they continue pushing it. Yeah. And it's amazing to me that this is a bipartisan thing. So once again, something you said earlier, uh, things when we get to consumer choice and government regulation, we're going to have to retool our own brains on how, you know, the political divide plays into that because it's a lot more than just the nomenclature of the parties. Uh, Brooke Medina, great stuff with this. The piece is in WNG.org. That's world news. I uh, encourage you to read it. Let folks know what you've got going on and where they can follow you on social media and what you got coming up next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so actually here at the John Locke Foundation, which is a North Carolina state-based think tank and advocacy group, uh, we have our Carolina Liberty Conference. So if you're in the Carolina area at all, if you go to lockclc.com, you can find more information about that. And so we're super excited to host um host a number of uh, speakers and we're gonna, I'm gonna actually going to moderate a panel on technology and policy. Um, so that's February 25th and 26th. So we would love for y'all to join us there, um, but also just go to johnlock.org. You can see a lot of free market ideas that have been floated around at a state level, but also how it intersects with the federal level. Um, so that's an excellent resource for you. And I would love to connect with you guys on Twitter. So. I am at Brooke underscore Medina underscore. Yeah, she's a great follow. They do good work and she's been a good friend for a couple of years. So it's good to reconnect with you. And we hope to make you regular on the program because you're doing exactly what we do. Turn down the noise on the news cycle and get the good information. And this is great information that folks need. So thank you for your time today, ma'am. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate you. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. You know, we have not been shy about what we think about the upcoming Winter Olympics in China. We think it's a farce. It is a propaganda coup for one of the most evil regimes on the planet. We should not be participating. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings. Yes, I know it's not fair to the athletes, but there's always some excuse to not do the right things. We shouldn't be there. And here's yet another story on why we shouldn't be here. We touched on this a couple of weeks ago, and we like to always come back and retouch and touch back in with these stories that we cover. We don't ever want to just drive by them and come back. Uh, this one's from our friend Jerry Dunleavy over at Washington Examiner. FCC bans Chinese company that is the official telecom provider for the Beijing Olympics. The Federal Communications Commission banned China Unicorn Americas, that's the name of the company, from the U.S. market, labeling the Chinese military-linked company as a national security threat, even as it's set to be the telecommunications provider at the Winter Olympics. Now, backing up from Jerry's piece just a second, remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about on this program, uh, the British Olympic Committee was telling their athletes not to take their own phones, or if they take them, don't to use them. They would give them temporary ones, but don't take your own phones over there because they're going to be violated. They're going to be tracked. They're going to be probably infiltrated and hacked. Uh, so here we go again. This is how they're going to do it. Uh, State-sponsored military sponsored telecommunication program in China, the official sponsor. That means they're going to be listening, watching, and data mining every single person from all over the globe that shows up, probably including all the dignitaries. Remember, a lot of politicians, a lot of world leaders, a lot of power players, a lot of rich folks going to show up to this thing. It is an intelligence coup for the Chinese apparatuses. Another reason not to be going back to Jerry's piece. Uh, Beijing's parent company, China Unicorn, Unicom, excuse me, 
keep saying unicorn, it's Unicom, sorry. Previously being blacklisted in the U.S. for its ties to the Chinese military, China Unicorn Americas has made its ties more explicit, deciding, describing itself as the wholly owned subsidiary of China Unicom, which of course it is because everything's run by the state or by the approval of the state in China. That's what a dictatorship does. The selection of the blacklisted and Hawaii and Huawei linked firm was made by China and not the International Olympic Committee, though the IOC itself has partnered ships with companies that have been linked to the Chinese government surveillance, surveillance implicated in used force Wager labor in Xinjiang and faces U.S. scrutiny as national security threats. China Unicom has made it clear. See, I got it right that time. China Unicom has made clear it's working closely with Huawei and relying on the Huawei technology for the Olympics. Huawei, one of the global leaders in 5G wireless technology, was designated a national security threat in the summer of 2020 with the FCC banning the company from accessing U.S. government subsidies to build communications infrastructure. That's not just us. Uh, the same controversy and problems have been happening in, Bay in Britain. Uh, they've had the same issues, and the EU has been debating it, although they love their Chinese money from the Chinese dictatorship, and they want the tech, so they have not been as voiceless as the U.K. and America has been. Finishing up with Jerry's piece, the Beijing Olympic website lists China Unicom as, quote, the official partner of Beijing 2022, and says leaders from the Beijing Organizing Community and China Unicom signed the partnership agreement during a December 2017 ceremony at China Unicom's Beijing headquarters. The Treasury Department added China Unicom to the Chinese Communist Chinese military companies list in January 2021, and the department followed up by placing it on the list of, quote, Chinese military industrial complex companies that June uh, Democrat FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, called China Unicom's response to the FCC's inquiry consistently incomplete, misleading, or incorrect. Those are all direct quotes. She said this wasn't the first action the FCC had taken to protect our communication infrastructure from the threat posed by Chinese state-owned carriers and promised that there is more to come. There's plenty more uh, in this thing, including the executive order signed by former President Donald Trump about the PRC's military industrial complex. Um, the New York Stock Exchange has delisted China Unicom. Uh, President Biden also uh, had an executive order. He undid some of what President Trump has done. You can read all this for yourself in Jerry Dunleavy's piece at Washington Examiner, FCC bans Chinese company that is the official telecom provider for the Beijing Olympics. Uh, touching back in on a recurring theme here, we shouldn't be there. We are giving the Chinese Communist Party a gift by being there. We should boycott it. We're not going to. Uh, the diplomatic boycott is insufficient because they're still getting all the data mining. They're still getting all the pub. They're still getting all the propaganda that they want from this thing. We should not be there. We're going to go anyway, but we're not going to be quiet about the fact that everything about this is wrong. It was corrupt how they got it. It's corrupt that they got it twice in recent history. It's corrupt that they won't be talking about the plight of the Wagers and the other uh, oppressed people. They're not going to talk about China's drastically bad human rights violation. They're not going to talk about how they're using predatory lending to take over places in Africa and other parts of the world. They're not going to talk about the threat they pose to the free nation of Taiwan, not part of China. Taiwan is an independent nation. Go ahead and get mad. China bought farms. And the other various problems that come with the Chinese Communist Party being evil, wicked, and unaccountable to greater humanity for what they're doing to the Chinese people and anybody else under their realm of influence. So no, we're not going to shut up about it. More Herd Tell right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. You know, we always try to end on a little bit of a happier or uplifting or at least something non-politics and culture related. Try to get a good note to send everybody off on at the end of each and every Herd Tell. This is a fun story. Uh, we're all familiar with viral videos. We all participate in viral videos. This one has got a good little story to it. Uh, this is from uh, ABC6 over in Philadelphia, WPVI. Uh, a good deed by three young boys is going viral on social media for all the right reasons. Richard Allen of Northwest Northeast Philadelphia, excuse me, Northwest Philadelphia, I apologize, said he immediately took out his phone and started recording when he spotted the selfless act last year. I was on my phone and noticed a bus pulled over and I see a group of kids 
helping an elderly man, Alan said. I said, wow, I have to go to report this. And what it was was these, uh, these uh, young people uh, saw this elderly person getting off the bus. Uh, they have one of the uh, wheelchair walker type things, and he had a bunch of bags. So the kids all jumped in, started helping with the bags, helped him get his, uh, it's the kind of walker where you can also turn around and sit down on that kind of thing. Alan was watching when the trio of young men helped the man with a walker and his bag. He said the act of kindness happened last year, but everything going on in the city, particular crime and the continued murder rate. He reposted the video on TikTok and it's been viewed across the globe. Quote, I wanted to basically get shared to a lot of different kids that actually see this video to want to do better, that you don't have to go unnoticed for doing bad all the time. You can be noticed for doing good things. Alan said he was so moved by what the boys did. He decided to pay for the kid, pay the kids for their actions. Alan hopes this will inspire other kids to do better. Um, used to be an old saying, you know, help helping the old folks across the street. Uh, these folks did it at a bus stop. Um, if you watch the video, uh, the way this is, this is in the city. So the bus is actually not in the bus lane because there's a car in the way and then it got videoed. So he actually is in the middle of the street trying to get off the bus. 6abc.com, excuse me. You can go watch it. It's viral. You may have already seen it, but that's the backstory for it. Um, if you're going to record stuff, don't just record the bad stuff. Make sure you share the good stuff in life. You know, people helping people, babies born, food. That's why we do Twitter Supper Club. Just take a picture of your food and share it. You'd be amazed how much that makes other people happy. Do the little things in life, folks. It makes a difference. And it'll make you feel better, too. Don't get all wrapped up in the doom scrolling, we call it, where you just do bad stuff nonstop. And if all else fails, you can always record a radio show with a puppy in your lap. That always helps you feel better, too. That'll do it for her tell today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, last week was substantially uh, one of the larger weeks we've ever had on the program as far as people watching and listening and engaging. Thank you. We've had week over week growth ever since we started doing the daily show back in December and the podcast itself for uh, about seven months now, various times, but it's all because of you. So thank you very much. However, you're watching on YouTube or listening on any of the podcast platforms, we sure appreciate it. But whatever platform you're watching on, if you could leave a comment and a rating, those are really important to us. We'd sure appreciate it. Uh, do that for us. That lets other people know our little program is worth checking out. We're going to keep turning down the noise of the news cycle. No caterwauling on this program. We're going to talk. We're going to listen. We're going to discuss because that's what's badly missing in our cultural and politic debate right now. So we're going to keep doing it. It's going to be a loud couple of months. we got Supreme Court justice to figure out. we got an election year coming up in November. Going to be a lot of noise. We're going to turn it down, get you to the information you need. So that'll do it for today. Wherever you and yours are, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. And we'll talk to you tomorrow on Hertel. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. So,